20% off of dice, 20% off of dice trays and gaming supplies. Easy Roller Dice has teamed up with me to offer 20% off of all dice and accessories on their website with coupon code, you guessed it, taking 20, like taking 20% off of dice and accessories. As in, you're taking 20% off of the price. Get it? 20% off. You get 20% off of all dice and accessories at Easy Roller Dice with coupon code TAKING20. What I'm trying to say is if you go to EasyRollerDice.com and pick up a new set of dice for yourself, you can use TAKING20 at checkout to get 20% off of those dice. Or you could even get a new metal set of dice for your girlfriend at EasyRollerDice.com and then use TAKING20 at checkout to get, get this, 20% off of those dice. Thank you, Easy Roller Dice, for sponsoring today's video and allowing us to take 20% off of all dice and accessories with coupon code TAKING20. All right, I'm gonna admit something that might seem a little strange, but it's the truth. When my friends and I were first starting out with Dungeons & Dragons, we had no idea that pre-written settings were a thing. We didn't play Spelljammer or Dragonlance or have adventures in Eberron. And I can still remember Sly over at Gen X Comics condescendingly explaining Living Greyhawk to us like we were wasting his time. Shout out to my fellow DFW nerds. But even then, spending our very limited money on a gazetteer with a map that we could make ourselves and a bunch of city names we were gonna have to commit to memory was frankly, Something we couldn't imagine doing. Every single game we played was created by us. The story, the dungeons, and well, the world. Now, I would be lying if I said our worlds had a huge amount of depth to them. Most of the times, it was just a means to an end. But eventually, we grew older and a little wiser, and our games became less about the dungeon and more about the story. And we found that the best stories had great backdrops, worlds with places and races that were as integral to the story as the villain was. Today, we're talking about world building, something I don't consider myself some sort of savant at, but something I have done for the past two decades. I have five world building tips that should help you build a strong foundation in your approach to your new world. I wanna start off with my golden rule. This is the one rule that I always consider before creating a new world for a campaign. It's the one piece of advice I give to DMs when they ask me, hey, how do I build a world? If you take away nothing else from this entire video, remember this one. The golden rule for world building as a dungeon master is to build a world that complements the type of game play you want in that campaign. What does that mean? Why did I say gameplay, right? And not like compliment the story that you wanna tell? Well, it's because the story is significantly more flexible than the type of gameplay. I can tell a love story in the world of Pirates of the Caribbean or Blade Runner, but it might be a little harder <laughs> to create a pirate ship battle with cannon fire in the middle of my Jurassic Park story, Starship Troopers or Terminator setting. Let me give you a slightly more reasonable example. I love to include a few puzzle dungeons and enjoy having my players explore lost ruins in my games. Again, that's focusing on style of gameplay, not story necessarily. So before I even begin to think about how many DDs I might want or what kind of magic system my world might have, I already know that I want to include a history to my world that would be indicative of having these areas for the players to go and explore. To continue with this example, I might have a civilization that mysteriously vanished, like the Dweamer from the Elder Scrolls series. Or I might have an ancient wizard king that erected several testing sites for his three sons to determine who had the skill and grit to lead a past or possibly even present nation in my world. I might give my world an entire new continent that was recently discovered with plenty of uncharted land for my players to, to discover, potentially with secret temples and dark gods spread throughout the entire place and so on. But before I chart a single city, draw a coastline, or create a single royal family, I start with the consideration for what type of gameplay I want to be able to support with my world. And then I move on to other motifs. Also, don't worry if you have a great deal of gameplay activities 
uh, that you want your world to support, a, a whole plethora of them. Look at the world of Galarian for Pathfinder. This is basically the, quote, we want to have plenty of room for wacky campaigns with our writers, end quote, world. It might not be everyone's cup of tea to have rune lords, ice hags, jungle elves, devil worshiping royal families, and spaceships, yes, spaceships, all supported in one setting, but there's no denying that Paizo has created plenty of room in their setting to tell pretty much any story that they want to. So, if you want to stop being a noob world builder, uh, make sure you think about the type of gameplay you and your players want out of your games. If you want to create adventures where your players are moving through the pitch black of the Underdark, start with your version of the Underdark. If you want your game to include a lot of variants and different alien-like terrains with purple and greens and browns, start there and build out a Stargate SG-1-like portal hub. And if you want your games to include a ton of royal houses in conflict with one another, like Game of Thrones, start a cast system that will be inducive to that type of gameplay. Okay, rule number two was a hard one for me when I was first starting out, and that's to leave yourself some holes to fill in later. Often, when I was world building my first few worlds, I wanted to create everything right then. I wanted everything to be concrete, absolutely locked in so that my players, uh, when they asked me something about the world, I could tell them. But again, as I became more practiced and a little wiser, I realized that the more blank spaces I had, the more flexibility I had to twist and mold my worlds to fit my campaign later. Now, I'm not necessarily advising that you avoid creating any cities other than the one your players are literally currently in. What I'm saying is, is that you can go into as much or as little detail as you want, as long as you have room to add on to it or fill it in with the additional details later. The reason for this is threefold. Uh, I really just wanted to say threefold in a video. First, you don't feel overwhelmed to write everything out now, which we will talk about here a little bit more in a moment. The second is that you can adapt your world to your story and campaign if you need to. And three, you're giving yourself room and more importantly, time to be inspired later. Let me give you a quick example before we move on to our third tip. Let's say I'm creating a new world and I have a lot of the basics starting to take shape. And I even have a, a solid coastline of cities to the south. And I know that I want to add an area to the west past the mountains called the Deadlands. And I know that in my world, I want the Deadlands to be considered cursed. And I may even know I want to include a few lost civilization sites in those Deadlands. But at that point, I will typically stop and say, okay, there is enough there for the time being. Let's move on to something else. And then later, when I watch a movie or read a book or a comment on my YouTube channel that inspires me, I might go back in and fill in a few of those blanks. If our campaign builds to the point where the party is headed off into the Deadlands, I can tailor what they find there to the motif of the campaign currently. Maybe the campaign is being built around stopping a powerful necromancer. That's one we talk about all the time. Now I can look at my gaps and say, okay, maybe they call this the Deadlands because of a powerful curse laid there ages ago. Maybe my players need to find a lost book of the dead to counteract and undo the magic from the necromancer. Maybe the curse was that the entire civilization that used to be there saw eternal life and succeeded. And now there is hidden away a city of the dead in the heart of this area who might rule it. Why would they hide themselves away, etc., etc. The point is I can tie this in as strongly or as little as I want. But if I had flushed it all out from the jump, I might not have even had the room and flexibility that I needed later. So leave yourself some gaps. It's okay to say your city has a trade district near the docks that is run by a gang. But maybe you shouldn't go into any more detail than just that. That way later you can get inspired and make the gang a bunch of were rats called the Grey Fangs and so on. All right, rule number three. Don't let yourself get stuck. Get something on paper. Something I've talked about before on this channel is analysis paralysis. Getting stuck in the mud trying to come up with the perfect answer to something, overthinking, and 
not getting anything actually written down or accomplished. Well, world building is one of the worst places for that to happen because it's so easy to, to get stuck in that mode. All right, here's a tip. Person, place, thing. If you are feeling inspired and you know exactly how you want to structure your cosmos or set your gods and goddesses, then you know what? Great. Go ham. But don't let yourself get stuck trying to get your entire map drawn out and where the mountains should go to create natural flowing streams down into rivers. Don't get stuck in the rabbit hole of looking up which software is best to start world building with. Start with a person, a place, or a thing and get something on paper. The best part about this approach is that you can start world building really any way you want. If you know you want a big capital name Xi because it goes to 11, uh, then start there. If you know that the centerpiece to your world is a ring created by a dark lord named Sauron, then start there. How all these people, places, and things tie together can be created later. But if you want to stop world building like a noob, you cannot become so obsessed with figuring out what god married what goddess to the point that you don't actually get anything written down. Not that that comes from personal experience or anything. Uh, also, while we're on the topic of software, I cannot recommend OneNote enough. Microsoft OneNote. It's free and you can quickly create person, place, and things tabs to just get going. And as your world begins to fill in, you can organize them and hyperlink. Seriously, people, Microsoft OneNote. Just jump in and start world building. Rule number four is one that probably helped me the most in taking my world building kind of to that next level. And that's to not feel forced to include anything. I know that sounds a little weird, but let me explain. If you want to start creating truly unique and interesting worlds, you need to stop thinking you have to cover all the Dungeons and Dragons bases. As in, just because it's in Dungeons and Dragons does not mean you have to include it in your world. Do you think the concept of a monk is silly as written because one day they're just a six-year-old kid on the streets and the next they just stop needing food or water because they got wiser? Uh, yeah, then don't have them in your world. Or if you hate the idea that there's an entire plane of existence that's literally just fire uh, and that's where all the fire elementals come from and instead you want fire elementals to come from the pits of hell and be purely evil instead, then just cut the plane of fire completely. And if you want any and all of your deities to only provide healing magic, whether they're evil or good, or you think alignment is just terrible altogether, and that in your world you want devils and demons to work together to serve a singular dark lord because souls are how deities in your world grow in power, all of that is fine. The point is, if you think you have to create gods with a portfolio for every cleric domain in the PHB or Xanathars, uh, you don't. This is your world. If you think the current schools of magic should be broken down into sub-schools even further, you can do that. Especially when it comes to the cosmos and the planes of existence, the, the afterlife, the fugue plane, deities and alignment and player races and class options. Guys, you guys don't have to include anything in traditional, in a traditional Dungeons and Dragons world. If you want to create a world with literally only humans, elves, dragonborn and orcs, and there is no such thing as trolls or giants or beholders or githyanki, that is perfectly fine. Now, as a Dungeon Master standpoint, I do want to add that anything you remove from the game, I would talk to your players and set expectations for before you ask them to commit to three to four hour sessions once a week for the next year. But as long as the group is on board, feel free to ignore anything that Wizards or Paizo has published. And finally, tip number five to stop world building like a total noob uh, is to think about painting the scene. I am a big believer in putting the fantasy into my fantasy worlds or the sci-fi into my sci-fi worlds. My advice is to create with tone in mind. What kind of tone am I trying to set and what kind of backdrop do I want for my story? Am I trying to create a sense of wonderment like we get so often in Harry Potter with Hogwarts and the Quidditch World Cup? 
Then I think about how to include those elements in my cities for the players to discover. Maybe with an eclectic market district filled with three-eyed giraffes used to taxi people across floating bridges and a, a talking statue in the middle that serves as an infinite waterfall. Do I want to create a tone of desperation and hopelessness? Like Warhammer, The Walking Dead, or many of the Game of Thrones seasons? Uh, to clarify, I meant like for the characters, not the hopelessness and desperation and regret that we all felt as viewers after season eight. Then maybe I'll spend some time overcrowding my cities, creating a history of recent wars and plagues, and adding in a few mass grave sites designed to incinerate the dead via those hellish fire elementals we talked about earlier. And when thinking about painting the scene, it doesn't all have to be just the places in your world. It might be the things like, how a powerful demon crystal was shattered into a hundred uh, sh different shards spread throughout the land and now the demons and monsters discovering them are mutating with tremendous power. Or it still might be the people as your world is protected by 12 red robed disciples whose task it is to maintain the magic barrier keeping the gates of hell closed and the material plane safe from their incursion. The point is, is to think about your world as an elevator pitch. What makes it different? What makes it unique? What types of gameplay and storytelling will it support? Is it more than just a reskin of generic fantasy setting number 4829-B? And when your players visit, what are the most interesting places they'll get to see? And when they see those places, will they be filled with wonderment and awe? Or will they feel the tug of a call to action to right so many injustices? What's the thing? that makes your world different, special, a place to have your adventures. If you can answer that, you're well on your way to stop world building like a noob. Obviously, this is a little more than simply an introduction to world building, but still there are many more, I'm not sure if techniques is the right word, but whatever, I'll go with techniques for now, that you can work on to continue to improve. There are certainly several different approaches that can be implemented, whether you want to start small or start big and start with your world or start with your people. All of those are example and none of them are the correct method, but I'll have to cover on what I would recommend in a later video if people are still interested in talking more about world building. So let me know any questions you guys have about this topic and maybe I'll end up covering them in said future video whenever that happens, okay? Whenever that happens. Now, it's time to pass it over to you guys in the community. What did I miss here? What tips do you guys have for your fellow dungeon masters and world builders? Do you guys write for other game systems that are not Dungeons and Dragons? I mean, are you guys creating your own worlds for Call of Cthulhu or World of Darkness? Or are you just using the default worlds associated with those games with those different mechanics systems? I'm genuinely curious. I of course want to give a huge shout out to all of the amazing supporters over at welcomeadventures.com. Guys, thank you so damn much. Um, I'm just incredibly grateful. Uh, because of your support, I can continue doing stuff like this. If you guys like what I do here, you want to support more content like this in a really easy way. Welcomeadventures.com is a great way to do that. You can snag some rewards for yourself, like new maps every month. You can jump in a game with me. You can have a one-on-one -on -one meeting to talk about the world that you are currently building and much more. So welcomeadventures.com is a great way to support the channel. If this is your first time here, or maybe it's your fifth and you still haven't pulled the trigger on subscribing and you love role playing games as much as I do, I would love to have you subscribe. I put out videos on GM tips, player tips, tutorials, and more just like this. So if that sounds like something you guys might be interested in, just hit the subscribe button down below and come join us. Thank you guys so much for watching. My name is Cody and may your games be filled with awesome memories and even better friends. I'll catch you guys next time. Yeah.